Shall we rise up to pray? I greet God in heaven. We thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you because you brought us together. So you can share your mind, your heart, and your message with us. Lord, we pray that tonight all those who have come to the Bible study here in all the other places, Nigeria, Africa, outside Africa, you bless every one of us together in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you open our eyes so we can see what you have for us in your word. And as we see, we pray our heart will believe your word and will act on the word in Jesus' name. Bless every one of us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We come to Matthew chapter 7. And tonight, we're looking at verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. We're talking about Christ. And we know that Jesus is Lord. We pray and we say, Jesus, our Lord. We sing it and we say, Jesus is Lord. And then we testify, we say, we made Jesus Christ our Savior and our Lord. But now Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they, or he, that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. To such ways, we need to understand that Jesus is Lord. In fact, if you look at John chapter 13. Reading from verse 13. Ye call me master and lord. And ye say well, for so I am. And you must know that he is lord before you can be saved. And you must believe him, accept him, and submit to him as the lord of your life. And that's right. You need to understand he is lord, he is king, and he is savior, he is the messiah. Is the one, the redeemer that came to take our sins away. And so you must say, Lord, you must believe his Lord. You must accept him as Lord. You must submit unto him as Lord. In fact, when Jesus Christ was born, in Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 11, Luke 2, verse 11, here is what we're told for unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Yes, he is Lord. But the Lord is simply telling us, you go beyond the verbal pronunciation. You go beyond the outward declaration. You go beyond the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And then you make him in a practical way, in a permanent, persistent way, in a spiritual way, the Lord of your life. Yes, you must say it. You must accept it. You must believe it, that Jesus is Lord. But you go beyond that and you actually submit to him that he is Lord, is a father, God Almighty, who has made him Lord. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom he crucified, both Lord and Christ. God has made him Christ, and has made him the Lord. And it's all right to know that he is Lord and to believe that he is Lord and to submit to him as Lord. But go beyond just saying it. Not everyone that says you must go beyond saying. There must be that mark in your life that even before you say it and after you have said it, we can tell that he is your Lord indeed. Do you remember when Saul was going to Damascus? And then the Lord spoke to him from heaven. And then he responded to the Lord. What did he call him? He called him Lord. And Jesus didn't say, don't call me Lord. 
That's his title. That's authority. That's his position. He is Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. And I'm reading there from verse 4. And he fell to the earth and had a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? That's all right, he is Lord. And Saul said, I'm hearing your voice. And a voice is coming from heaven. And here I am opposing this great mighty God of heaven. Who art thou Lord? And in that verse 5 the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he trembling as and as he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He called him Lord again. Lord, what will you have me to do? I submit, I surrender, I give the control of my life unto you. From now on, every step I take, every work I do, every service I render, and every action that comes out of me will be under your lordship, under your rulership, under your control. Your sovereignty, Lord, what will you have me to do? It's all right to call him Lord. In fact, if you don't call him Lord, how can you be saved? Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. That's it. You need to confess him as Lord before you can be saved. That if you'll confess with your mouth the Lordship of Christ and shall believe in thine heart that God God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, he is Lord. But you know, when you make him Lord, that means you are going to reject other lords. You are going to dethrone other gods. You are going to destroy, nullify, annul. Remove the lordship or the control of any other master, any other lord, because he will not have a rival. He must have the control of your life, the total control. And if you just say, Lord, Lord, and the total control of your life is not in his hand, that's not acceptable. In Isaiah chapter 26, Isaiah 26. I'm reading from verse 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. You know, it's the prince of peace. And there is no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. But as you forsake your sin, and you bend low beneath, under the feet, at the feet of Jesus, and you say, Lord, I surrender my life unto you. I give the control of my life into your hand. My will, I want you to be swallowed up in your will. Now, you are the controller and the ruler and the sovereign and the Lord of my life. Lord, thou wilt hold in peace for us. For thou hast wrought all our works in us. Work of grace salvation forgiveness redemption now you are made a child of god and say so this is not of the work of our own hand it's not because of what we have done but because of what he did you have done this work in me born again saved and because of that work of grace that I feel, I sense, I believe. And I see the spirit of God operating in my life. Now you are the Lord of my life. Look at verse 13. O Lord our God, all the lords beside thee have had dominion over us in the past. We've been controlled by this Lord, that Lord, and that Lord. But now we come to surrender. Yield, submit, a will, our lives unto you. Other lords have beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only, by thee only. That's how to make him Lord. Now you submit and surrender. There's no rival anymore, and there is no other alternative. He 
is a final Lord and the only Lord, it says, but by the only we will make mention of thy name. That's what it means to make him actually Lord. Come back now to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Now you understand that Lord, Master, the same king. King, ruler, the same thing. And the high one, the most high, the same thing. You make him Lord of your life. The controller of your life. The ruler of your life. The master of your life. But Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Ruler, ruler. Controller, controller. Redeemer, redeemer. Savior, savior. Master, master. Not everyone that says that shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they say it, but they don't do it. They don't demonstrate it. What example do we have of people that will say, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, Sovereign, Sovereign, Controller, Ruler, and yet they never submitted. It was all from the mouth. And he didn't reach into their heart. Look at Mark chapter 14. In Mark chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 43. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests. And the scribes and the elders, and he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goes straight away to him and says, Master, Master, Lord, Lord, Christ, Christ. Lord, Lord, Master, Master, and he kissed him, and he laid their hands on him and took him. You see that? The other is carriers, the other are backsliders, who just do their own will, who are self-willed. They are backsliders who do not submit to the word of God. They are backsliders who live in disobedience or rebellion from day to day. They are backsliders who love money more than they love Christ. And they still say, Lord, Lord. And they still sing the song. And they pray the prayer. And they reach the word. And they give the testimony. And they shout on top of their voices, Lord, Lord. Jesus said, that kind of calling me Lord will not earn you anything. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Like Judas Iscariot. The people who have never submitted their will, their mind unto the Lord. And they just go their way. They rather sell the Lord than miss their money. They'll rather sell the Lord than give up the worldliness. They'll rather sell the Lord than give up their rebellion and disobedience. Lord, Lord, hey, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, not he that did in the past. You know, there are some people, all the testimony of, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I love the Lord. I was born again, 19 such and such, 2000 and such, past testimony. Not the people that did. You know, there are other people too, they are always making promises. So, Lord, you know, I'm just going to obey you. I'm going to do this and do this and do that. Not those who will do in the future. The people that do it now, the people, whatever the challenge and whatever the confrontation and whatever the event, the people that do, they're doing it at this very time. 
when it's tough, the will of God. When it's hard, not my will, but thine be done. The people that are in full submission to the will of God, even when they are saying, oh Lord, can this cup pass by me? But if it's a will that I drink it, thy will be done. The people that will make their shoulders take the yoke. And the people that will deny themselves. And the people that will say, no matter how hard or tough or difficult and no matter how painful, I am going to do the will of God. He that doeth the will of my father. Not the will of, you know, our father here on earth. How many times, you know, you say you're a Christian. It may be in the area of marriage. And then your father or your mother or your people or somebody or a master or a director somewhere will say, this is what you do. And you know, that's not the will of God. But you say, if I don't obey them, I lose my job. If I don't obey them, I lose all the favors I have from them. And because I don't want to lose that, oh Lord, you understand? Why do you call him Lord? Well, you're just making up your mind to exalt a human father. A human person, a human director, a human controller above the Lord Jesus Christ. But the people that will say, whatever the cost, whatever the challenge, I will do and do and do. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that, yes, he's Lord. And he wants us to understand that when you make that practical, spiritual, and then you live a righteous life, resisting temptation, and walking in the way of the Lord, in obedience and submission to the will, to the word of God every time, that's how to get to the kingdom of God. Actually, Jesus Christ, you'll see, he emphasized the kingdom every time. Have you noticed in this Sermon on the Mount, from the very first part of the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall have inherit the kingdom of heaven. And now he's coming to the end, and he's still talking about the kingdom. Because his goal, his purpose, is to take people away from the kingdom of this world, kingdom of darkness, and bring them into the kingdom of God. That was the whole purpose of his coming. The whole purpose of his sacrifice, the ultimate goal of our faith in him, and the ultimate goal of our fellowship with him. Uh, you must have a goal, a goal, a purpose, a destination, something you want to arrive at. You know, there are people that just walk and walk and walk. There's no goal. It's like somebody on a journey and he doesn't have any goal, any destination. But Jesus Christ in everything he did, he had a goal. And the goal is to make sure that he brings you out of darkness and brings you into the kingdom of God. And therefore he's always emphasizing the kingdom. And he says now, I'm concluding the message. I'm concluding the Sermon on the Mount, and I want to remind you once again the most important thing that is in our preaching, that is in our teaching, that is the reason I'm healing, that is the reason for the deliverances, that is the reason for the ex explanation, that is the reason for all the parables, that is the reason for everything Jesus came to do to bring us into the kingdom. And you know that that's the reason for everything we do as well. To get people saved. To get people into the kingdom. And every time, you, every time you're thinking about doing something, you ask yourself, what's my goal here? Are you preaching? What's my goal? Are you teaching? What's my goal? Are you helping people? What's my goal? Are you praying for them? What's my goal? Are you counseling? What's my goal? Are you in fellowship with somebody? What's my goal? Are you in friendship with somebody? What's my goal? The goal of everything Christians who follow Christ, the goal of everything we do is to lead people out of where they are and bring them into the kingdom of God. In fact, the goal of marriage you know, sometimes today people think we get married so as to fulfill, satisfy the pleasures of the flesh. If that's all, you'll be of all men, women, the most miserable. 
you'll find that, that that satisfaction doesn't last. And the goal is so that you'll be able to have a partner that when you're tired will lift you up. And when you're weary will, will, will give you some spiritual energy. And then we'll be able to lead you on so that the goal of getting to heaven, you'll be able to make it the goal of having children. Children. It's that God gives us those children to be able to lead them into the kingdom of God. We educate them, that's just side issue. And all the other things that we do for them, that's a side issue. The goal of having those children is not just to send them to school, get them educated. The goal is to take them to heaven. Many years ago, there was, you know, one brother who proposed to a sister and said, uh, can I have your hand in marriage? I, I feel I know the will of God to you. And the sister said, well, I will pray. But before I pray, can I ask you a question? Uh, the question is, my desire is to get to heaven. Before I pray, I'm going to pray. But if I get married to you, should in case uh, God says yes, say yes to him. If I get married to you, will you take me to heaven? Oh, and the brother said, I'm sorry about that. I, don't, I wasn't thinking in that direction. I, I, to get to heaven myself is a big deal. I don't know I'm going to make it myself. And then to have another person and then to commit myself. I'll take you to heaven. I'm sorry, I cannot promise that. Then the sister said, I'm sorry. I cannot even pray about it. I'm looking for somebody. That's the goal of my existence in life, which is to get to heaven. That that person will assist me and help me, aid me, support me, lift me up, so that I can get to heaven. You understand? Anything you're planning to do, if you're not thinking about that thing, helping you, assisting you to get to heaven, forget about it. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth every day. Every time, in every thing that she do, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The Lord is warning us against self-deception. And the Lord is reminding us that mere knowledge that Christ is Lord. Without making him the Lord, the controller, the ruler of our lives will not grant us any place in his kingdom. Is telling us a great profession of submission to Christ without the possession of grace. To obey him is of no value to him. Fine talk without faithful walk will not make it. Those who do not enter the kingdom of grace here on earth will never enter the kingdom of glory in the great beyond. Except we enter the kingdom of godliness here we shall not be able to enter the kingdom of god hereafter that's why the lord is bringing this verse before us today and he wants us to look at it analyze it and break it down bring it together again make an application of it in your life and then you think about what you are hearing not just to fulfill all righteousness i'm at the bible study today i always come and i don't want to miss the bible so not just that but for you to take these important words of christ and measure your life, evaluate your life, evaluate your submission. With this word of God, would you say that you go beyond just calling him Lord, Lord? Would you say that everything you do in your life, there's no, there's no time you forget the lordship, the control, the rulership, the sovereignty of the Lord upon your life. Let's look at it. We're going to divide the story to three parts. Number one, the insufficiency of superficial devotion without regeneration. The insufficiency of superficial devotion without regeneration. Number two, the insincerity of sentimental disciples devoid of righteousness. Is it is sincerity of those sentimental people, Lord, Lord, Christ, Christ, Jesus, Jesus, Savior, Savior. The insincerity 
of those people that are sentimental without righteousness. Number three, the indispensability. That's what just means. Something is indispensable, important, necessary. I could say the importance of steadfast dedication to righteousness. You can say the necessity of steadfast dedication to righteousness. Let, let's come to number one. The insufficiency of superficial devotion without regeneration. I want you to understand. Superficial means it's on the surface. It's only the mouth. It doesn't go deep into the heart. There is no change. There's no transformation in the heart. It's just religion. Sunday, Sunday religion. Christmas time religion. Easter time religion. It's the religion of the Lenten season. Just religion without regeneration, without transformation. That superficial nominal Christianity. Christian in name is not sufficient. There must be a deep work of grace in you that will go deep into your heart, excavate, dig up the evil things that were, that were hidden there. And as they are dug up, thrown away, there's a cleansing with the blood of Jesus Christ. There's an empty space there in the heart that is not free of sin. And you feel light. Something has taken place. A deep, great work of grace has taken place. But without that work of grace, just coming to church, putting on your scarf, dressing the Christian dress, Singing the Christian song. Brother, sister, just calling your brother, sister. Without a change of heart. That will not do to get to heaven. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Lord, who are the people that will enter? He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why call ye, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Lord, what did you say? I said, repent ye and believe the gospel. Why do you just call me Lord, Lord, and you don't repent? Lord, what did you say? I said, I didn't come to call the self-righteous Pharisees. I came to call sinners to repentance. Why didn't you repent? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Lord, what did you say? I said, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that somebody has ought against you, leave your gift there at the altar, and go and reconcile with your brother, then come back and offer your gift. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And then the offenses are piling up. Between husband and wife, between parents and children, the offenses are piling up. I will still keep on bringing gifts to the altar, services to the altar. The bitterness is in the heart piling up. The disobedience is there piling up. And the misunderstanding representation is there between leader and uh, the members in the local church. And we just keep on bringing our gifts. And then the offenses are piling up until if we're not careful, somebody gets to a point of no return. Like Judas Iscariot, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The things I told you. Did I tell you that if your wife offends you seven times in a day, that she, and then she says to so my husband, dear, I'm sorry, forgive her. And then move on in fellowship and love together. And then you have that thing against your wife because of all those things that have happened. You're just living in the house like two tenants together. 
And then you're still saying, Lord, Lord. You're still singing, Lord, Lord. You're still preaching. Mention the name of the Lord. You're seeing the prayer warriors, Lord, Lord. Answer our prayers. Why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. Didn't I tell you, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Didn't I tell you that this is the reason why I came to seek and to save the lost? And then I gave you occupy till I come. When last did you do that? Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? And yet, we never miss coming to listen to him. We never miss coming to read his word. And we just say, Lord, 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 every time. We even say it more than two times. Many times. And yet, we will not do what he has said. And the Lord is saying, this is not sufficient. This will not take us to heaven. Why? Call ye me Lord, Lord, not do the things which I say. We're looking at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 25. When once the master of the house is risen up and as short and as short to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord. They have always been saying that. They've lost the meaning. They've lost the importance. They've lost the significance of those great, beautiful words. But they've said it so often without any meaning and without any impact in their hearts that they just keep on saying and on the final day after the door to the kingdom has been shut after the privilege of repentance is gone never to return after the opportunity to get saved is gone never to be recovered they still come it's now it's part of their language now they know how to say it then they said lord lord open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not when ye are what? But we know you. We know your name. Didn't you hear us now calling you Lord, Lord? And then in verse 26, then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and, as, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Think about that. Think about that. I hate to think, but it's real. That anyone here looking at me, eyeball to eyeball. Anyone there listening to me and watching now. I hate to think about it, but it's real. That on the final day, you'll say, you have taught us. We read your word. We studied your word. Our preachers preached the word, your word unto us. I memorized the word. I can recite and repeat the word. I sang the same word. Seek it for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Those are your words. I sang them. And then the Lord will say, but I don't know you. Oh Lord, but I know you. I know you. I know your name. I know your title. I know your message. I know everything. And Jesus says, but I don't know you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. What the Lord is expecting is not just that we read his word. Or sing his word. Or preach his word. Or counsel with his word. Or encourage other people with his word. Or memorize his word. What the Lord is expecting will take those words. And those words will lead us to repentance. A change of life. They will be able to say, Lord, I don't only know the word. I know the author of that word. And I know the origin of that word. And I know the efficacy of that word in my life. And there is a change, a turning around. I feel it in my soul. And I know you are present there. And every time I want to take a decision, I want to go this way and take, go that way, your word comes to me and says, this is the way to go. And Lord, I thank you for the grace you have given me. And I'm following through on that word. That's what it takes to get to heaven. 
And so Jesus said, I will say unto you, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Verse 28, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourselves thrust out. That word thrust. That to push somebody out. To throw somebody out. Can you imagine as we're coming in through that gate tonight. You wanted to enter into the church building. And usher there just grabbed you and threw you away. You said, how can somebody do like this? Our ushers don't do that now, but the angels will do it on that final day. Well, you just, you know, come expecting. Maybe you're still singing your song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And then you're expecting, I'm going to just get in there. The gates of heaven will open wide. And then I'll go in. Uh, by the way, you've spent so many years listening to the word of God. You know the name. You know the title. You know the, the Bible from cover to cover. The only problem is you never repented. You never gave your life to Christ. And you parents, listen to me. Our children that are born in the church, they know the doctrine. They have to know it. They've been coming every time. They know the songs. They have to know those songs. They've been coming every time. And they know the verses. And they know the salvation, the sanctification. The only goes back, they can answer the questions. They go to us fellowship, don't they? They come to Sunday worship, don't they? They come to the Bible study, are they not here? And yet, they just come. And the parents at home did not ask their children, now my child, are you born again? Are you saved? I know that you, you are interested in scripture. You know the scriptures. And then you are following the pastor. You love the pastor, I can tell. You love him, and you love his word, and you want to speak like he speaks. Are you born again, my daughter? Are you born again, my son? If you don't do that on that final day, and, and you know the danger, once a child becomes a teenager, and he's not born again, gets into his 20s, and he's not born again, and he dresses like we dress, because that's how the parents have brought them up. And you say what we say. That's how the prince have brought them up. But the experience of salvation is missing. And then eventually they grow into their thirties. And they're just Christians by name. Nominal Christians. Nominal deep alive. Superficial. But the real experience of salvation is not there. They don't do some of the bad, bad things that the people of the world do. They are not brought up that way. But the experience of salvation is missing. And then eventually you'll be surprised to get to the other side. And then your children come. Now they're no more little children. They're real adults, but they're still your children. And they say, Lord, Lord, they're knocking at the door. And Jesus said, who is there? Oh, I'm so and so. My daddy was a preacher. My mommy was a great worker in our church. And our church had a great name. Our church is called Deep Alive. Very deep, not shallow. And then Jesus said, let me check up your name here. Your name is not in the book of life. Oh Lord, but I know all the songs. If you say GHS number this and this, I'll tell you what it is. But Jesus said, I just Lord, Lord. Are you born again? That's what we need to think about so that we wake up. And it will not just be shallow, superficial, dry religion without righteousness. I pray God will revive this church. And this nominal Christianity that is almost taking over people knowing the dry verse. Knowing the letter of the word that kills. Not having the spirit. I pray that all these nominalism, the Lord will take it away in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. In Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 31. Ezekiel 33 verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people come in. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words. 
but they will not do them. You see, the emphasis is not just hearing it. The emphasis is doing them. And when last did you do the word? I'm asking you. You may come in now. Did you come? Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Are you more humble? Blessed are they that mourn when you've done something that Spirit of God convicts you about. Do you mourn? Blessed are the meek, since so you have heard and heard. Did you do that? Are you meek and lowly, gentle and humble? Blessed are they that thirst and hunger at a righteousness. You have a passion, hunger at a righteousness. Are you passionate about it? When last did you pray and fast and say, Lord, I want to become more pure, more pure, more holy? And then blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a peacemaker or a troublemaker? Are you people that scatter? Destroy? Do you take joy to make somebody angry? To provoke? You've heard. And blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. Rejoice in that day for great is your reward in heaven. Do you rejoice when the persecution comes? Ye are the salt of the earth. Do you make the lives of other people sweet? Ye are the light of the world. A, 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 a house that is a set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before me. Are you shining? Or are you just coming and hearing and hearing and hearing? Are you doing it? And now be ye perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect. Is there any endeavor? Is there any passion? Any desire? Any goal? Any aspiration? Any ambition? Lord, perfect me. Do something in my life. Or are we just here? That's what Jesus is saying. That it's not the people that just come to hear, but the people that hear it and they go on their knees and they say, Lord, give me the grace. I want to do it. Or we'll do it. I said we will do it. But you know, if you go to if you go through all these studies from one, number one, now this is study number 66. And maybe you've not missed anyone. You know, if you pile that, if you take all the 66 outlines and you pile them up, we'll see. Well, see, this is a great pile. But do we see that increase? We see the increase of paper as we pile them up. Do we see the increase of spiritual experience? And that's what I should be thinking about. That's what you should be thinking about. Or do we still act the same way and think the same way and move the same way and talk the same way and think the same way and behave the same way? There should be a change so that it's not just hearing and hearing. We will join, we will add, doing, we will do it. Look at Ezekiel again, chapter 33, verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouths they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. I pray that as the change comes, that change will be visible even for the angels of God to see. And for our brothers and sisters around us, even to see and to notice in our lives in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. There's a concern in the heart of Christ. There's a concern in the heart of any sincere child of God about those of us. We are coming to the Bible study. Those of us who are reading the Bible, the concern in the heart of a genuine child of God, that none of us will be superficial, nominal, dry, unproductive. None of us will just be a Christian in name without having the nature of Christ. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sadi's right. The thing says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, thou hast a name. 
a name that you're a living Christian in a living church. Thou hast a name that thou livest, but art dead. That's a concern. That you'll not just be spiritually dead, religious people. Having names that we live, but you have a lively, productive, spiritual experience in Christ. In verse 17, verse 17 it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not, knowest not, knowest not, that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Think about that. A person going with the hope of getting to heaven, saying, I am rich in spiritual things, because of the many verses of scripture he knows. And because of the many messages he has heard, I'm rich. And because of many things he can talk about, many miracles he can talk about, I'm rich. And because of the material things that surround him, I'm rich. And knowest not, knowest not that thou art wretched, naked, blind, poor, miserable. Then the Lord said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness will not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy self, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore, and do what? It's not be zealous and work, be zealous and be more active. The activities are almost too many, but now it's to repent, to be restored into the grace of God, and to have the life of Christ within us. Be zealous. Therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh. Will I grind to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, do we have ears to hear? I said, do we have ears to hear? He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We'll come to point number two. The insincerity of sentimental disciples devoid of righteousness. Sentimental disciples. Sentimental disciples. Those are the talkers. They're not the doers. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. We'll just stop there for a moment. Look up here, brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, sometimes when you, you're talking to somebody and the fellow says, ah, wait, this is my church. You dare not say anything negative about my church in my presence. If you want us to continue any friendship, fellowship, interaction together, anytime we come, don't touch my church. That's great. That's wonderful. When that same man, that same woman, wants to do something that his mind is bent on doing, like, you understand, marriage, and the same church Teaching us the word of God that he is defending, almost wanting to get into a fight with somebody. And he says, don't touch my church. That same church now says, sister, there's no way here. You cannot do this. You cannot go this direction. And she says, what? Whatever you say, go and tell them. Even the one that is preaching on Monday, that man on top, go and tell him, this one, I will do this one. Ah, there you are. Yeah, the one that is, you know, boasting. This is my church. Don't touch my church. I'm a member of this church. I will die in this church. But now it comes to something. 
about your will and the will of God. And what we're teaching you, the word of God. Now, you forget, this is my church. You forget the submission that you spoke about. You know, that, that's, how you, that's how you know those who are real. That's how you know those who are just superficial, sentimental. If you really love the church and you love the word of God we're teaching you, once, if you're going in a particular direction and we say, sister, look at the word. That cannot be. Sister, brother, look at the word. This cannot be. Oh, I'm sorry. You surrender immediately. That's the evidence that you have, the real grace of God in you. But be, to be so bent on something and to say whatever they preach, whatever they say, even the one that is, you know, the overall leader, even if he says it, this is what I'm going to do. Where is your commitment to the Lordship of Christ and to the word of Christ? That's what Jesus said. Don't let us just sit here and be deceiving ourselves. Not everyone. That says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth, I pray I will be a doer. And you know, it's easy to preach if you've been preaching for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's easy for anybody to come here and preach. But to do it, to do it, it's more difficult than preaching. It's, it's easy for anybody to sing. You know, if we ask any, even if you are not a member of the choir, and we don't have our, you know, beautiful voices around, I would say, Jesus only, who can lead it for us? Almost anybody there can just, you know, bring it up. Jesus only and Jesus ever. Anybody can do, anybody can sing to do it, to do it. If, if we want to lead us fellowship, and then a house fellowship leader is not around, and then we say, you are not a house fellowship leader, but you'll be coming. Can you take it over today without almost any preparation? Anybody can lead and teach? Anybody can open the Bible? Anybody can recite memory verse? Anybody can take the outline and the book and then read it to the people and bring a discussion to do it? That's a grace. That's a thing that shows you have been at the feet of Christ and the grace of God has done something in you. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth. You need to pray that God will help you. I said that God will help you. Uh, you know, sometimes I used to wonder, I see some of these committed people, like, you know, some of my brothers here, this one here, that one here, and they just stand there like that. In the security world, one hour, one and a half hours while I'm preaching, they just keep on standing there. And I used to, what, this is marvel, this is, this is something great. I realize now that if you've done, if you are trained as a soldier, as a policeman, and you have been trained all these years, you can just stand like that. Anybody can do that after the training. We can do that either the doing of the word of God. That's the important thing. So don't tell me I'm committed. Don't tell me I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. We can do that by training and by practice. But to have the word of God, when it comes to you in the area of marriage, it comes to you in the area of work, it comes to you in the area of submission, it comes to you in the area of bearing discipline, it comes to you in the area of obedience, submission to the word of God, and then you're able to just submit and bend low and say, oh Lord, this is tough, but not my will. Thine be done. That is the evidence of the grace of God in our lives. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, tell me, that doeth. You keep on doing it. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And let's look at John chapter 2, verse 23. John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 23. Yeah, it says, Now, when he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover, in the feast, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, but 
Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. You know, they all came, we believe, we believe, we believe. We're part of the crowd. We're part of the team. We're part of your disciples. And then it says he couldn't commit himself unto them because he, he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, verse 14, verse 15. John chapter 6, verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this says of a truth, the prophet, notice that, the prophet, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a what? What did they call him in verse 14? What did they call him in verse 14? What did they want to force him to become in verse 15? You see that? You see that? And they were not following what they knew. It's not the people that call me Lord, Lord. They will not enter, but the people that follow through. They, call, they said, this is that prophet that is to come. They quoted that from Deuteronomy. When that prophet is come, what will he do? I will put my watch in his mouth. And then he will give you that word. And anyone that will not obey that word, I will require it of him. That's what it says. And they said of a truth, this is that prophet which was to come. And yet in the next verse now, they said, forget about that. We need a social reformation, economic reformation. And if this person that is giving us bread, just multiplying it, if we make him king, forget about the prophet. If we make him king, he'll give us food. Economy will change. The price of food will come down. You see that? You are not thinking about the will of God. That the will of God is for him to be a prophet. To be the prophet that shall come. The savior of the world. But now they wanted him to be king. That's why you need to be careful. What you say is not enough. Your utterance is not enough. Your declaration is not enough. And yet your quotation of the Bible is not enough. But how you plow through and you are consistent. And you are and, and you're persistent in that word. I know he is a prophet that has come from God. The word of God is in his mouth. He's going to give me that word. And I'm going to yield my life completely to that word. Without any pretense at all. That's what the Lord is expecting. And then it says when they will force him to be a king were told that he departed again into a mountain himself alone and then we're reading from verse 24 and then it says when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there neither his disciples they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus and when they had found him on the other side of the sea they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Lord, Ruler, Controller, Director, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered and said, Verily, I say, verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, and because, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Your stomach is uh, what is driving you to me, not your heart. You see what the Lord is saying? Don't just come because of the miracles of food and miracles of getting employment and miracles of getting job. Come because you want to get to heaven. You want to give your heart to the Lord. And you want to submit unto the watch of the Lord. Don't just come because of the opportunity we're giving you and the privileges we're giving you. And if, if there were no opportunities, if we said the work you are doing now, we're sorry, we want to give it to another person, no opportunity again, would you still come? And would you still be submissive? Would you still yield yourself? Or the thing that is motivating you is not the depth of the word you are hearing. It's because of this, this, and this. What if all those things are not there? 
what will be your attitude? That's what Jesus was telling them. Neighbor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for he must God the Father sealed. Well, let me show you the conclusion of that section in verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? And he said, We didn't think that was what we were going to say. When he multiplied the bread and told us to sit down, and then we filed up, and then we ate and ate, we thought he'll do another thing. And then he'll multiply the bread again. We're running after him so that we'll be able to have an easy life. But look at what he's saying now. He's saying, don't worry about that one. Eternal life. Heaven. Kingdom of God. Ah, if it is like that, I don't think I want to continue. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. We didn't you hear, Rabbi, Master, Lord, when did you come here? We've been looking for you. Why are you looking for him? He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's what you should do. And then in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. I'm just wondering now, what should Jesus have done? Shouldn't Jesus, hey, come back. Why are you going? Okay, because uh, there's no bread again. The power is still here. Are you hungry? All right, everybody sit down now and then make the bread again. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. He's not looking for superficial people. He's not looking for just a crowd. A crowd that only comes to eat. A crowd that's only looking for, you know, miracle. He was looking for people who will get to the kingdom of God. And you should make yourself one of the people that you will save. Whether this is there or not, whether that is there or not, heaven is my goal. Am I speaking for you? You want to get to heaven. That's why we're here. Why do you think we abandoned everything and left everything behind and just come over here every Monday night to study the word of God? It's not for bread and butter. It's for the kingdom of God. After all, this world is passing away and everything will soon end. But the thing that will never end, eternal life. And then look at verse, 60, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Because I'm not interested in just, you know, getting people together for bread and butter. I want to get you to the kingdom of God. That's my aim. That's my purpose. Any other thing I gave you is just by the side. It's a side issue. And the real thing is for you to get to heaven. And those other people have shown that's not their interest. That's not their heart. How about you? Will you also go away? They only remained 12. You know, a teeming multitude crowd running after him. Remaining 12 and he still said, will you go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve? Tell me the rest. And can you think about somebody hearing everything that Jesus said? And many, many people went away and these fellows still stayed in there. And yet you didn't have the mind to do the will of God. Just stayed in there. You won't drive me away. I will never leave this place, but I'll never do what you say. I don't want to get to heaven, but I'll never leave this place. Knock me, strike me, beat me, chastise me, preach the word, use the acts of the word, and almost cut me down. I'm not leaving. I'm staying, but I'll not do it. Judas Iscariot, I pray you'll not be a Judas. I, I, I don't understand how a man like Judas, when they were only 12, only 12, and then he was looking at them like this, and Judas did not look down. J Judas looked at him face to face, just like this. And Jesus said, will you also go away? And was looking at them. 
And Judas did not bend or blink or anything, just kept on looking. And then Jesus said, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? And Judas did not move. He didn't show any sign. All the others didn't know about him. I wonder how people can be like that. You want to make sure that your heart is just to do the will of God. To bend your will to the word of God. And to say, the only reason I came to a Bible study like this is that I want to get to the kingdom of God. I, hope, I pray God will help you to go there. We're looking at, uh, uh, we're looking at Psalm, Psalm 78. Psalm 78, I'm reading from verse 35. Psalm 78, verse 35. Sentimental disciples. The insincerity of that. Just coming and coming. Part of the crowd, part of the people. But not having a real definite Christian experience. Psalm 78, verse 35. And they remembered that God was their rock. And the high God, the redeemer... Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouths, and they lied unto him with their tongues. They called him Redeemer. They called him Savior. They said he was their Lord, and yet it says, nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they led and they lied unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him. Check up your heart today. Why are you here? Why are you coming? What's your goal? What's your purpose? Why are you coming every time? Are you just there? You're here, but you never do. You never pray. You never repent. You never have the real definite work of grace in your heart, in your life. And there's no transformation. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Do you sense that newness? Do you know that newness? Do your neighbors see that newness? Do your neighbors know that newness? Newness of life and newness of character. And it says, for their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. I pray that the Lord will bring a change today in Jesus' name. You see, during those, uh, those early, early days uh, of ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, there were many superficial, sentimental followers that called him Lord, but their hearts did not cleave unto him. They were not wholeheartedly committed unto him, and he could not commit himself unto them. He just said, Lord, I'll follow you, but they had some other things, some other priorities they wanted to follow. Like many others, their hearts did not agree with their mouth. And their will did not support their words. It was verbal acknowledgement of the truth concerning Christ as Lord. But that will not open the way, the way to eternal enjoyment in Christ's kingdom. Except we have experienced the true repentance and sound conversion. All outward profession will be found useless, worthless, so damning on the final day of reckoning. If it is not accompanied with a gracious character in doing the will of the Heavenly Father, no matter how loudly we profess to accept Christ and his teaching, unless we are wholeheartedly committed to doing the will of God from the heart, we shall be shockingly disappointed on that final day. Obedience to the word of God is what marks us as God's children. I come to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the indispensability of steadfast dedication to righteousness. The indispensability that is the importance, that is the necessity, the priority of steadfast dedication to righteousness. Would you understand that righteousness is the key if we're going to get to heaven? In fact, that's what you'll find in the oppression of the dealing of God with man from Genesis Revelation. Righteousness. Righteousness. And not just verbal declaration. Not just verbal testimony. Not just Lord, Lord. 
not just coming to church, not just water baptism, and not just having membership cards in a good church, but being a righteous, transformed, transparent child of God, living by the word, submissive to the will of God every time, everywhere. Look at your word. Look at the word now in Genesis chapter 7. And notice the word righteous or righteousness. And you'll see this is the indispensable thing, the necessary thing, the important thing. Genesis chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. How did he escape the judgment of God? Righteousness. Thee, have I found righteous? Thee, have I seen righteous in this generation? Look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous or the wicked? The people that were saved after Sodom and Gomorrah, why were they saved? Righteousness. Righteousness. Will you destroy the righteous or the wicked? And it says, for adventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. The emphasis is on righteousness, not religion. What if you find 50 righteous people there? Will that also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein, that be far from thee, to do after this manner, to slay the righteous? You will see then, the emphasis is righteousness. It's not just a superficial kind of thing. And the Lord said in verse 26, If I find him in Sodom, 50 righteous within the city. The emphasis is righteousness. If we're going to make it, I pray we'll make it. Numbers chapter 23 verse 10. In Numbers chapter 23 verse 10, Who can count the dust of Jacob? And the number of the fourth part of Israel, let me die the death of the righteous. Let me die the death of the righteous. This man, Balaam, he knew if he was going to get to that heavenly city, glorious city, it will take righteousness. That's why he prayed, let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. You ought to know that is righteousness. I'm reading Psalm 15. Psalm 15 from verse 1. Psalm 15, we're reading from verse 1. Here it says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness. To ascend to that holy city and to get into that heavenly glory, righteousness in Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in each, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord, to be delivered from the wrath to come. And to escape the judgment that is coming upon this world, that's what it requires, righteousness. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 20, For I say unto you that except your, your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can you see that? From the very beginning of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and going on through the Old Testament, and coming to the first book of the New Testament, the emphasis is righteousness. It's not just coming to church, coming to Bible study, dressing like a Christian, having a name that you live, but you are dead spiritually. Righteousness, except... Your righteousness shall exceed, shall go beyond, shall be greater than the righteousness, superficial righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case, in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. I pray we will enter. Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 41. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. 
It says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth. Then shall the righteous, the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see the emphasis then is righteousness. The indispensability, the importance, the necessity of righteousness if we're going to get into the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 25 verse 46. Matthew 25 46. Righteousness. That's the key. That's the important thing. Indispensable thing to get us into the kingdom. Matthew 25 verse 46. These shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous, the righteous into life eternal. Not just raising up your hand in a crusade. Not just identifying physically, outwardly, openly with the visible church. But having this grace of God in you. And then the righteousness is from within. And the Lord actually walks it out in First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness. That's it. You want to get to heaven? Follow after, pursue righteousness. And we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God's Son is sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If any man, if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful laws, but follow righteousness. That's it. Righteousness. Follow righteousness. The Lord is telling us that if we're going to get to heaven, there's, there's, no, other, there's no alternative. We must pray and then have all our sins taken away and forgiven. Have the grace of God in us to produce that righteousness of faith, righteousness of God within our hearts. Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Is when that righteousness is there, then verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's what it takes, righteousness, if we're going to get there. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Righteousness. That's what the Lord is expecting. That as the Lord is speaking to us, is correcting us, and is pointing the right way unto us, it says we need to wake up and understand that the end can come at any time, either by death or by rapture. And it says if we're going to live with him up on high, in heaven, in eternity, it will take righteousness. What do we do then? Verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet 
lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, that's the righteousness, without which no man shall see the Lord. I pray we'll see the Lord. Second Peter, I'm reading chapter 2. Second Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 4, verse 5. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the whole world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. You see that? From the beginning to the end, it's all righteousness. Not how to be saved. That's how to get to the kingdom of God and to escape the sin that is coming upon this world on the final day. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men come slackness, but his long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth what? righteousness. That's the requirement. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was given, was granted, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And so you find out what God requires. That if we're going to spend eternity with God in heaven, it requires righteousness. How do we get that righteousness? We come to the Lord. He has the righteousness. We have sin. We give him our sin. We give him our iniquity. We give him our depravity. We give him all the, all the iniquity that might have within us. And then when he takes our sin, he gives us his righteousness. And then we begin to live a righteous life by his grace. And step by step and day after day by prayer by the study of the word, by leaning on the power of the spirit of God will remain righteous and holy. And when they, that day will come, you'll be there, I will be there, we'll be there in Jesus' name. It takes righteousness, consistent, continual, day to day, day by day, daily righteousness. And the Lord did it for people like Noah, like Enoch, like Elijah, like Joshua, like David, like Samuel. Who did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Did it for Daniel? And did it for John the Baptist and John the Beloved and Peter and Paul and Stephen and Philip and the rest of them? The Lord who did it for them is not a partial God. He says, I'm God. I, there's no respect of persons with God. He did it for them. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for me. If we ask him, he will do it for us. That's why the Lord is telling us now in Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. That's what they did. They prayed and then the Lord gave it to them. They prayed and the Lord preserved them in that righteousness. We will pray and the Lord will preserve it in us too. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. Sow to yourself in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he come and rain righteousness upon you. Can he do it? Will you allow him to do it? 
Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we need that righteousness. We want to get to heaven. We're not just coming here to just be superficial Christians, just to read the word and just to study the word. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I yield, I surrender, I commit myself to you. I don't want to just uh, be coming to church without any, without hearing the word and yielding to the word and submitting to the word. I don't want to call him Lord, 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 and then not submit to his will. Whatever it is that is opposing, resisting the will of God in your life, let the Lord come and shatter it and break it and crush it and then put something within you, the mighty grace of the Lord, so that you will live a righteous life every day of your life. Tell the Lord, if you need to be saved, you can tell the Lord, confess your sin before the Lord and repent and the Lord will forgive you and the Lord will change your life, make you a new creature. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. Transformation. It will give you a transparent life, a righteous life, a beautiful life, a gracious life. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and God in this present world tell the Lord he'll do it for you he'll do it for you if you're sincere if you want to get to heaven you don't want to just be a nominal Christian just present physically not everyone that says unto me Lord Lord shall inherit that enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth he that doeth the will of God the will of my father which is in heaven the Lord is calling upon you. Check up your heart. Check up your life. The Lord is no respect of persons. He wants us to come before him. And he wants us to give ourselves fully, completely unto him. Don't be like Judas Iscariot. Hearing all the words. Even preaching the words. Even saying the words. Even going on evangelistic trip. And yet, not having the grace of God. Not having that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. And say, Lord, here am I today. Make a change. A transformation in my life. The reason you are coming to church is so you'll get to heaven at last. You're not just coming to be religious. You're not just coming to be superficial. You're not just coming to be sentimental. You're not just coming to join the crowd. You want to get to heaven, you will tell the Lord. And children, you are born, maybe you are born in this church. And you know the doctrine, you know the verses, you sing the songs, you pray the prayers. But how are you giving your life unto the Lord? Are you born again? Are you yielded to the Lord, children, young people, and adults who have been coming? Are you born again? Does the Spirit of God bear testimony in your heart that things are different now? That things are different now? The things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to wear, I wear them no more. And the things I used to say and the attitude I used to have, I have them no more. The bitterness you used to have, you have that no more. And the Absalom, the, the ambition of Absalom you used to have, you have that no more. You submit your heart, your life, you submit everything you are unto the Lord. And then it becomes the Lord, the master, the controller, the director of your life. Don't just be a person saying, Lord, 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 while you have not submitted your heart unto the Lord. Submit yourself unto him and everything you hear in the teaching of the word of God you make up your mind that you will do it that you will do it to be saved yes you'll be saved and after you are saved to be sanctified to be circumcised that had that Adamic nature will be dealt with that propensity to sin will be dealt with. That depravity in the heart will be dealt with. And the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. And then he'll make you transparently holy. Transparently righteous. Transparently pure. The word of God says, Blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. For they shall be filled. 
that your thirst, your hunger, your passion will be for righteousness, will be for holiness. All those selfish ambitions that are taken away, all those religious things, all your religious bent of your life, they're taken away. All you want is, Lord, I want to get to heaven. Lord, I want to be righteous. Lord, I want to be holy. Lord, I want to be pure. Pure within and pure without. Pure at home and pure in church. Pure in the place of work and pure in the bus. Pure in the street and pure everywhere. That the Lord will do that work in your life. You will know that this is what the Lord has done. And then when that day will come. And then the saints of God are marching in. You will be among the number that will be able to go in. You will be among the number that will be able to go in. Because you are saved. And because you are sanctified. And because that righteousness, that holiness. That will help us to see the Lord. Because the Lord has done it in your life. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man, no man, no matter your position, no man, no matter your profession, no man shall see the Lord without holiness. Talk to the Lord as well we came. So that we'll not be hearers of the word only, we'll be doers of the word. Doers of the word. You plunge yourself into the word of God. And every sin the Lord has pointed out in your life, corrected in your life, every sin the Lord has said, hi about this, hi about this. If you want to get to heaven, you say, Lord, I lay this on the altar. Lord, I lay this on the altar. Lord, I lay this on the altar. If there are restitutions to make, you go ahead and make the restitution. If there's any apology to make, you go ahead and make the apology. If there's anything to correct, you go ahead and correct that sin. What's important to you is not what people think, what people say, what people feel, what people discuss about you. That's not important. What's important is what does God know about you? What does God know about you? Are there things in your life that are hidden? That if those things remain there, you'll not be able to get to heaven. Why don't you bring them to the Lord today and say, Lord, this is my day. This is my chance. I want to get to heaven. I want to stop playing religion. I want to stop playing religion. I want to have righteousness. The righteousness will open the way, open the gate for me to be able to get to heaven righteousness holiness godliness christ likeness the very nature of god in man then it affects your attitude the pride is gone the hard-heartedness is gone the hypocrisy is gone and the sensitivity to the voice of god all that is gone the hardened conscience all that is gone you come before the altar of the earth and say lord here am i do something in me today that i'll be able to carry through life in the grace of god in the righteousness of god righteousness of faith that mind will not be a shallow testimony a superficial testimony just a make-believe just a profession of the mouth but my heart, my life, everything within me will be real and genuine. The real grace of God manifesting itself in my life. Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. And then make sure that the only thing that's important to you is your experience with the Lord. Your salvation experience. Your sanctification experience. Your submission unto the Lord. And you're doing the will of God from day to day, from moment to moment. That's the only thing that is important now. All those other things of the past that you used to think about and worry about and get anxious about. All those things are not important anymore. Just to love the Lord. Just to serve the Lord. Just to obey the Lord. Just to submit to the Lord. Just to do the will of God who is in heaven. That's all that's important. That's all that's important. The final day is coming. And that day is fast approaching. And the only thing that will matter on that final day is the righteousness that you have in the Lord. By grace, by faith, that translates into the practical life, the new life, the new nature, the new character, the new behavior, and the submission to the will, to the word of God. Not just your membership in the church, your submission to his word. Your obedience to his word. 
your experience of salvation, your experience of sanctification, your experience of holiness, your experience of following the Lord day after day, your experience of doing the will of God in marriage, listening to the word of God in marriage, not having your own will, not being self-willed, not opposing the will, the revelation of the word of God, but saying, oh Lord, what's marriage if it takes me away from heaven? What's money if it takes me away from the kingdom of God? What's friendship if it takes me away from heaven? What's privilege if it takes me away from heaven? Oh Lord, all that matters to me is where will I spend eternity? Where will you spend eternity? That call comes to you today. Where will you spend eternity? You have the grace of God in you. Saved, sanctified, holy, righteous, pure, sincere, humble, pride is gone. Tell the Lord, break up your fallow ground. So to yourself in righteousness. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and he rains righteousness upon us. Let him bring that righteousness. A rain, a flood of righteousness. And let him wipe away all iniquity, all sin, all carelessness. Let him wipe that away. All that attitude and the state of backsliding. Let him wash that away. So you become a real, real, real child of God. And the power of righteousness works in your life. A new creature. With a new nature. With a new life. With a new language. With a new behavior. With a new characteristic. Righteousness. 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 The garbage of the saints. Yes, it'll close the world. Righteousness. He'll do that work in you if you allow him. The promise is yours. And for all that will call upon the Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And you'll be free. Free and free indeed. Free from sin. Outward sin and inward sin. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. And the Lord Jesus Christ appeared that he might destroy all those works of the devil. Let the Lord do it herein is righteousness. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous, he that doeth not righteousness and will not be able to see the Lord on the final day. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, he that doeth, he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Pray that the Lord will make you a doer of the world. A believer, righteous, holy, sanctified, in a practical way, serving the Lord. In the day, in the night, in the public, in the private, or the men, or the women, when you are alone, when you are strangers, when you are in the church, when you are outside the church. Righteousness every time. Righteousness all the way through. Righteousness in your place of work. Righteousness in the house fellowship. Righteousness in your community. Righteousness in the family. Righteousness. That's what the Lord brought you here for. That that righteous Christ, righteous Lord, Redeemer, will do something in your life. And then he'll so purge you, he will so cleanse you, he'll so purify you. You'll never be the same again. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Let him do it, and then you'll rejoice and will rejoice with you. That God has done something that will take you from earth to heaven. Righteousness through Christ, righteousness in Christ.